We can say amen to that, right? Okay, well, now it's time to jump into the Word. So hopefully you have brought your Bible with you, be it a paper copy, be it an electronic copy. I want you to bring it with you so that you can make notes, you can highlight, you can look at the text yourself. So we're continuing in our series in the book of Proverbs titled Lessons in the Wisdom from Solomon or Wisdom That Works. And so we're going to look at the entirety of chapter 5 Today. So if you have a Bible, go ahead, open up to chapter 5. And by the way, if you're with us online, there are notes there that you can download, and there's some notes here uh, for you that you can follow along and look back on if you so desire. So in the book of Proverbs, if you've been with us, we hear God's voice coming to us uh, as a father to his children, urging us and calling us to listen, treasure, Hold on to and apply his words. And so you can imagine a good parent sitting down with their child or sitting down with you and saying, listen to me, what I have to speak to you, the advice that I have to give to you will be helpful. It'll be life-giving. It'll keep you away from sorrows and dangers. Please listen to what I have to say. And that voice of our good father continues to call out even to us in our day. And the book of Proverbs calls to us to seek wisdom, to gain understanding. And God addresses various compartments or facilities in our life where each and every one of us needs wisdom. I am grateful for God's goodness shown in the wisdom and advice he gives us. The question is not, is God speaking? The question is, do we have ears to hear? Are we giving ourselves over? Are we being attentive? Are we looking for the wisdom that God offers to us? So this morning again, we jump into this wisdom. And God lays out two paths for us to follow. One is the pathway of the pursuit of physical fulfillment outside of the covenant of marriage. So this is what is being addressed in this passage this morning. And the other pathway is of physical fulfillment inside the covenant of marriage. Now, this indeed is an important topic that we need the wisdom and guidance of God because there are so many loud voices in our society offering to us their wisdom on our physical desires and sexuality. God calls us as well and asks us to listen and learn from him and choose the pathway that is right that is good, that is blessed, versus all other paths that we can choose that will not and do not turn out well for us. And so it's an important topic in our society, and it's an urgent topic for some of us as well. So we'll see this uh, topic uh, addressed again in the end of chapter 6 into chapter 7, because God says, hey, will you listen to me on this subject? Okay? So the Father encourages us and pleads with us again that we listen to what he has to say. And he tells us what we need to watch out for. He tells us what we need to embrace. And each and every one of us has a choice to make. And so the main points are um, put in the terms of choose. Choose, number one, to see what is true. We'll see this from the text. Second, choose the path of discipline. And thirdly, we'll see to choose to enjoy what is yours Alone. So that is the advice that God gives us this morning. Okay, so this is Proverbs chapter 5, starting with verse 1. 
And you'll see I'm using the NIV version. This is the 2011 version. And I, when I put these together, I look at five, six different versions. I look at the original languages. And you'll see some changes there, perhaps, to what you have in your Bible. But it is indeed true to what is written. Okay? So here's the first advice that God gives to us when concerning our physical desires and what is forbidden. Okay, choose number one to see what is true. And this, by the way, is harder than you think. So let's look at this. My son, my daughter, pay attention to my wisdom. Okay, you see this again as a father calling out to his children. Turn your ear to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter poison, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. So again we hear as a father calling out to his son, to his daughter, saying, listen to me. If you listen, if you pay attention, you may maintain discre discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. So what God is telling us is something that we know. You see the word preserve and maintain. This is something far as our physical desires, far as our uh, sexual fidelity, is something we know that is sacred, that is special, that is wise to watch over and safeguard and use in a way that is provided and appropriate. And so he says, listen, my son, my daughter, not just when you are young, but in the totality of your life. Remember these things. Don't stray from the good and right and honoring pathway. Because as you know, living in this society, that there are many voices calling us to fulfill our physical desires. From a click of a button, to a turning of a page, to a, a glance, and another glance. And there is lots of temptation, lots of encouragement to go on a way, to fulfill physical desires in a way that will not turn out well. That was true in Solomon's day, and it is equally true in our day. And so he gives us this call, say, pay attention, listen, and then he tells us in verse 3 that all that is advertised is not the reality of the result. And he goes on to describe someone who is forbidden. Your, your Bible may say an adulterous woman or an adulterous man, and describing them in terms that seem quite appealing, right? In verse 3, for the lips of the forbidden woman, the forbidden person, the person who you are not married to, you have not made a commitment or covenant with, their lips drip honey. And the speech the enticement is smoother than oil, right? That is true. If temptation wasn't tempting, it wouldn't be an issue, right? 
There are literal temptations. There are um, people who are very enticing with their physical appearance and enticing with their smooth invitation to join them. Can we say, just acknowledge that? That's the case, right? That's the case. And so there's acknowledgement by our good father to his children saying, hey, in this world, there are people who will entice you by their beauty. There are people who entice you by their words, little by little. And it can be intoxicating, it can be appealing, and it looks and sounds so good. True in that day, true in our day, true in every day. And this is reality. But the wisdom and advice from God is, see beyond the veneer. Look beyond the beautiful packaging. Because the product itself, even though initially it drips with honey and is smoother than oil, will not result in good things for you. Verse 4. But if you follow in this pathway, in the end, she or he is a bitter poison, sharp as a double-edged sword. If you were going to poison someone, would you make sure that that poison is detectable or would you put it in something that was unpleasant? The answer is no. You make the poison as appealing as possible. You would disguise it in something that is good with the intent that when taken in, when ingested, it would remove life, injure a person, and cause harm. I have seen this happen time and time again. What looks so good and is so appealing ends to be this. Now, I can say this personally, and I can say it in observing in my own family. Now, personally, okay, I, and I'm going to, this is in a a purchasing of a package that didn't turn out well. Okay, I'll just put it that way. I didn't see beyond. I needed a vehicle. I needed a car. I went to, of all places, Craigslist. Did anyone here shop on Craigslist? Wouldn't recommend it, Okay turned into a really seedy thing, by the way. So I thought I found this car. I went to go look at a car in the dark. First mistake, right? First mistake. Car looked nice, right? The Grand Am, and some of you know this car that I had. It was white. It had a sunroof. It looked really cool. I'm like, yeah, that's a cool car, right? So I took it out for a little drive. It seemed to work just fine. I had... <laughs> the cash in hand, and so I'm like, that's cool, I look cool in that car, and so Dave, in all of his great wisdom, handed over the cash in the dark and drove away. Well, the next couple days, I thought it would be a good thing to bring this car to the mechanic. My mechanic didn't think the car was as cool as I thought it was. I, it needed more repairs, and I bought it, I'll just give you the numbers, I bought it for three grand, and needed about six grand of repairs. So this car that I thought was a great deal, that looked really good, the inside was not really good, right? And so I tried to return this car, and of course there was no answer on the other line. And so here I was, three grand deep, in a nine grand piece of trash that I 
kept nursing along, put in way too much money, and regretted my purchase. Now, why did I follow, fall for this? I bought a nice package, but I didn't look at the reality that was there. That often happens when we are looking for physical, sexual fulfillment outside of what God has provided for us. Seems good, seems right, very appealing, but one thing leads to another, and the poison sinks in and robs us of our energy, of our life, and we'll see a little bit later so very much more. Now, when it comes to physical adultery, uh, my dad, who had uh, passed away 11 years ago, um, he was a man who was going into the ministry. And I've shared about this just a little bit. And my, my dad, when he was in his early 40s, fell for this. He fell for a lady that he worked with. He worked at a hospital as a chemical dependency counselor. And the appeal must have been great. And so instead of keeping true to my mom and uh, his three sons, which I am one, he decided that that appeal was greater than the covenant that he made. And so he then followed after her. And then my parents were divorced, and for literally about two decades, no, one decade, time and time again, when we went and saw my dad, there was someone else, and there was someone else, and then there was someone else. And it depleted him of his energy. It depleted him of his life. It depleted him of his um, strength. It depleted him in so many ways until he finally came back to the Lord and said, how foolish I was. One of my dad's greatest regrets, and I interviewed him um, before he died, was falling away from the Lord, number one, and following into these type of traps. That's part of my story. And if we went around with a microphone, there could be lots of stories, I'm sure, of people who have fallen into the trap of what is forbidden and have taken the bitter poison. And that thing that they thought was so good came back and put a dagger in their heart. Goes on, okay, in this passage, and one other thing, we'll continue on. Talking about this person, talking about the person who is trying to trap people in. Her feet go down to death. And this, by the way, could be a man or a woman, okay? Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her past wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. Has anyone here heard of something on the internet called a thirst trap? I know what I'm talking about. It's okay to admit it, okay? A, a thirst trap. This is, and it's a, great, um, it's a great phrase, very appropriate. This is a post on social media. Okay, typically this is an Instagram thing or a Facebook thing or an internet advertisement it's called a thirst trap where it is a, a photo often or a video of someone uh, flaunting their stuff i'll just put it that way right and trying to prey on your thirst the physical desire and trying to get you to like them trying to get you to focus in trying to get you to click on another link that leads you to another place that leads you to another thing it's called a thirst trap and it happens all the time. You don't have to get far away from the internet to find things like this. That happens today. And people who are doing this want to gain attention, want to get 1.3 million followers or whatever, so that they can get the adoration of society and also get their money by clicks and paying for certain um, restricted access sites. This is happening all the time and is rampant in our society. Now, people who give themselves to do this, it describes them here. 
They're not giving thought to their ways, going to this person or that thing and aimlessly wandering around. So if you know, this is secondary, but if you know someone who is using their um, physical being, their body and their words to entice other people, often they're caught in a place of not thinking about the future, not thinking to where this ends up and trying to trap people to get what they want right now and it does not end well. So this is the first choice I want you to think about when you encounter a thirst trap. Someone or something that is pulling to your physical desires. Ask God and choose to see what is true about this thing, about this person about this experience where will this take me where will this go what will this ultimately do to me to my relationships to my life the advice of god is see what is true in these things see beyond the dripping honey see beyond the smooth appeal and think where is this leading Now, second, we'll see this, another choice we have to make. And the appeal is, choose the path of discipline. As he continues, starting with verse 7. Now then, my sons, now then, my daughters, listen to me. Don't turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from me. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you lose your honor to others and your years to the one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your strength and your toil enriches the house of another. At the end of your life, you'll grow. When your flesh and body are consumed, you will say, How I hated discipline. How my heart despised correction. Wouldn't they, my teachers, or listen closely? To my instructors, I have come to the verge of complete ruin before the entire community. So this is one who took the path of sexual gratification and fulfillment, and we'll see God's provision. First we get... Um, saying these are some warnings and this is what I provided for you. But this is one who took that path. And there's a very significant line in these verses that say, at the end of your life you will groan when your flesh and body are consumed. This person who's engaged in this type of extramarital physical connection has turned their body into a commodity. Something to be bought, something to be bartered with, something to be used. When your body and flesh are consumed. In our culture, are we... I think we're fixated on youthfulness, right? Always trying to be younger, always trying to be fitter, always trying to be more visually appealing. Is that something that happens in our country? All the time, right? It's a billion dollar industry with now plastic surgery of various enhancements to makeup and to creams and me as a late 40-year-old male, now I'm getting things in my news feeds talking about 
my bags underneath my eyes and how to get rid of them. And I start to think, wow, maybe I should take a look at this, right? You, get, you guys get this stuff? I get this stuff, right? What? Why? Because fruit is most appealing when it's the ripest, right? And so we try to keep that appeal because we want the actual fruit. <laughs> Guess what? It's okay to be old. I wanted to hear some amens. Thank you. You're like, is it okay? Yes! <laughs> there, there's something beautiful about young love. I'll just put that. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Something beautiful. And that love is beautiful. There's something also beautiful about old love. Where those now wrinkles have become familiar to you. Those, those crows, what did they call these things? Crow's feet. That's right. And the scars and the familiarness. Something beautiful about mature love. I'll put it that There's beauty in all of those seasons. And in good relationships, it gets like a fine wine better with time. Or solid, more fulfilling. I've seen people that have lived this way, and I would put my dad in this category in some way, that after his body could no longer, uh, no longer was appealing, after his bank account was drained, Kick to the side. And I'm go get another model. I'm going to go get another body to consume, right? You've seen it. Where are you when you're 70, when you're 80, when you're 90? Those who gave you so much attention, where are they when you need help? When you are sick, when your hair falls out. This is what it's talking about. A person who is older saying, I wish I would have listened. Now my life has come to complete ruin. And this happens to people time and time again. Go to the next slide. This is an important line that you may want to highlight. If you take what does not belong to you, you wind up losing what does. I want to let this sink in. If you take with not, what does not belong to you, you wind up losing what does. So see the truth of what's being offered to you. Choose the path of being disciplined. Know that in that pathway is the wisdom and the provision of God. God recognizes that we have physical desires. He made us with those desires. And so next we'll see in the last section of this chapter of Proverbs this point that we are to choose to enjoy what is yours alone. There, there just isn't prohibition, but there's also provision. I'm giving you something for you to enjoy that should be yours alone. Proverbs chapter 5, starting with verse 15. Now, my son, my, my daughter, drink water from your own sister. Running water from your own well. You see this, your own cistern, your own well, your own provision. Should your springs, in verse 16, overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed. And may you rejoice in the wife 
of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated with her love. Why, my son, be captivated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? Aren't you grateful that God provides for us good things? I'm grateful. And there's a recognition that there is a hunger put inside of us for this type of physical intimacy. And I want you to remember that the same guy who wrote the book of Proverbs was the guy who wrote the book of the Song of Solomon. Have any of you read that book? It's spicy, right? The book of Song of Solomon describes physical, intimate, dare I say the word, of course, sexual love, okay? And so the guy who, who, through the wisdom and the Spirit of God, says, hey, watch out for this, but enjoy this, wrote to us about that. And you'll see similar imagery that we see in here about a fountain and about these waters. Let me read from the Song of Solomon. And I don't think I've ever read from the Song of Solomon in a Sunday morning, but here we go, okay? <laughs> similar imagery. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A spring locks, so you see this um, fidelity here. A fountain field. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with all choice, choicest fruits. Henna with nard, nard with saffron, calamus and cinnamon with all trees of fragrance, myrrh, myrrh and aloes with all choices, choice spices. A garden fountain, a well of living water and flowing streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind. Blow upon my garden, let its spices flow. That is spicy indeed. Describing their physical, intimate relationship as a fountain, as a good thing. And you see this blessing in this passage, verse 18. May your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. This is a blessing on a physical relationship. And you can say amen to that, right? God says, I am blessing with you with this, and my blessing is upon you. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. By the way, that does not necessarily mean a young wife. It doesn't mean that. It means the wife as an anniversary was had 29 years ago. Our marriage is 26 years ago. When I said yes, I was a young man. May she always be captivating to me. May your spouse, excuse me, always be captivating to you. Our bodies are not meant to be consumed, but we are meant to be captivating to our spouse. You can say amen to that, right? And I pray God's blessing in that way as well. And God says, I've given you a provision. Enjoy that what is yours and yours alone. Don't take your sexuality and... Um, Make it available to anybody and to everybody. As it says, poured out on the streets and made available in the public square. This will not bless you. Water in its rightful place is helpful. I am glad when I turn on my kitchen faucet, there's water that is contained in pipes that blesses me. Water outside of those pipes are not a blessing. Okay? If you have ever had a flood in your house of your own making, right? 
not a blessing, right? I almost last week created a waterfall here in our baptismal fount, by the way. It was close to the top, and I did not know it. Dave was filling it himself because Fred wasn't here, and I thought I knew what I was doing. I did not, okay? That water would have come and have been a nice water feature for a little while, and then we've had major problems. Same is true, okay, uh, with our <laughs> sexuality. Put with inside of the confines that God has given to us, it's a blessing. But outside of it, it can cause major damage. This making sense. Choose to enjoy what is yours alone. Lots of things to talk about there. We do a lot of marriage counseling, talking about various things. Generally speaking, careful, choose what is right and disciplined, enjoy the covenant spouse God has given to you. Lastly, and this is the last part, and we're going to conclude with this. Verse 21, this is how this section is summed up. For your ways are in full view of the Lord. And he examines all your path. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. He is entangled in the ropes of his own sin. For lack of discipline, they will die. Let us stray by their own great stupidity. Sin often in scripture, sin being what is outside of God's good command, trespassing into areas that are forbidden, that are seem so appealing, always end up being entangling. Slowing us down, binding us in. What is promised is freedom and what is delivered is bondage. I've seen it, experienced it to a degree, and it has entangled our society. Again, in the cry of freedom, there is captivity. So this is the prayer. I'm going to conclude. One a good topic, it's a sobering topic, it's a personal topic, but the effects are wide-reaching. It's a massive struggle in our society, and again, the subject will be addressed, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after. We look at the end of six and into seven, that's just a heads up. This is my hope, and I would say this is God's hope. That your physical relationship with your spouse, pray that God will provide good spouses. That that would be healthy and holy and enjoyable and fun and satisfying. But also that we, our society, wouldn't give ourselves over to these, it's a great term, thirst traps that look so good but end so poorly. And some of the destruction that we see in the fabric of our society is because people have been coming, uh, become entrapped by these things. And so, the prayer is gonna be threefold. It'll be in one direction that God would bless our marriages. Second, that we would have wisdom to discern and not give in to temptation. Third would be for those who are just entrapped, entangled, and uh, 
struggle and they don't want to say anything. That there would be freedom. The God who pursues will, the goodness, and you'll experience that. So I want you to think about these things. Pray for our society. If you need help to talk. So God, here we are this morning, gathered in this place. And what a great morning it's been. So grateful to see friends and an old God. So grateful who are guests who are with us. So grateful for those joining us in other places. God, we're grateful that your goodness pursues us. We're grateful that your spirit transforms us. God, we're grateful that in your grace you provide us your wisdom and you tell us what is good and what the good paths are. And you warn us from things and pathways that don't end well for us. And so God, yeah, we talked about a, a sensitive topic today. And I'm glad, Father, that you address this topic. Because we need your wisdom. <laughs> we need your wisdom. And so we do pray. At first, I do pray for marriages in this that marriages would be strong and the physical intimate component of the marriages would be good and beautiful and wonderful helpful and life giving we thank you for the good provision that you've given to us and each other god i do pray for those who are on the verge of stepping across that line God, I ask for, uh, for grace and mercy. God, we ask for help to see the truth of what lies beyond the exterior appeal. God, I ask that none of us will be what, like is described, this old man saying, how I wish I would have listened. Save us from that. Or thirdly, thirdly, I do pray for those who are trapped and tangled in one way or another. It's been a fight for a long time. God, I ask for your provision. God, I ask for your strength. God, I ask for your grace. I ask for mercy. I ask for help. And that you would help those who are there, even this day. That there would be strength and encouragement. Lord, I also think of those who are waiting for a spouse. And those who have been abused by partners in the past, abandoned so much of that. Or we ask for mercy, or we ask for the grace, we ask for healing, we ask for the right partner, God, when you provide these So we're grateful to you for your goodness to us. Thank you that you treat us in love, treat us like sons and daughters. Thank you for your goodness and your health in Jesus. Amen.